Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Cinema Wave podcast. We are here today to talk about Francis Ford Coppola's highly anticipated potential train wreck epic. It is called Megalopolis. It's been decades in the making. I am going to be one of your hosts. My name is Darren Scalamoni. I am joined this time by Vinny Albano. Hello, hello. We got a lot to talk about with this one. Yeah. This is a really interesting movie uh, that we we talked about it, I think, on our most anticipated episode. Um, I don't know if it made either any of our lists, but it was one that we discussed, I remember. Mm. Um, just talking about the, the sort of uh, weight that this project could have, because this is something that Francis Ford Coppola had been trying to make this movie for decades. I think it was like maybe 40 years, might have been 30 years. Um, if you guys are new out there and don't understand, maybe you've just heard of this movie on The Outlier. Francis Ford Coppola is an iconic and legendary director. He did the Godfather trilogy. He had done um, Apocalypse Now. He's done... What's the other big one I'm forgetting? Uh, he did The Conversation. He did The Conversation. He did The Outsiders. He's done a bunch of stuff. Now, the last... The last real big movie he made was in 1997. So that was mm. t- that was 27 years ago, only a couple years after I was born. Mm. You weren't even born yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't even a thought. You weren't even a thought. Yeah. And so <laughs> the fact that he comes back out with a movie like this and the story behind it, I'm sure many people who are watching this review probably already know. But if you don't, this is a movie that Coppola had been wanting to make for such a long time, couldn't get the funding that he decided to fully fund the project himself. Um, and it went wide. The, the release went wide. It did terrible at the box office, but mm. we can get to the box office at the end. Right now, I feel like we should get into the film and exactly what it is. Um, we'll try our best to avoid spoilers in the first few minutes of this in case you guys are just kind of seeing what our what our thoughts are initially. And then uh, we'll warn you guys when we go into spoiler territory. Um, and then you guys can go see the movie or pause it there bookmark it and then come back to it and check it out then but Vinny, uh i read your letterbox review right after i walked out of the movie Hmm. and i thought you did a really great job of encapsulating how you felt about the movie and really what the movie was trying trying to say so if you can give your non-spoiler sort of broad thoughts on this movie Hmm. to the best of your ability the floor is yours yeah so first things first this film is about a dystopian futuristic version of new york city uh retitled new rome city and it's essentially a a retelling of a roman empire-esque fable it follows adam driver who plays this genius who can the so-called the genius that can stop time and he's a brilliant inventor that is trying to create this utopia megalopolis but uh First things first, I, I think uh, the, the infamousy like you covered around this film, Francis Ford Coppola has been trying to make this for so long, and he self-financed this entire thing. He sold a piece of his wine business just so he could make this film, and that's really bold, and I, you know, first things first is I respect this film. Although I did not enjoy this film, I respect it in almost in a lot of degree, in a lot of manner, because it's self-financed completely. This is a director who was so passionate about a vision that he went the lengths, you know, before uh, I know he's he's getting to older age. Mm -hmm. And he said in an interview that he wasn't going to die to not do this project. So he sold this a part of his business and he really just this is a kind of first and i think probably last in the industry where we're ever going to see a film like this and and see such a self-financed unfiltered artistic vision by such an acclaimed director probably ever uh, but <laughs> the movie is incredibly sloppy it is incredibly disjointed. It, although I respect what he was trying to do, it just doesn't work. I think that there are some great elements, and I'm I'm kind of I, I wrote about this in my, in my letterbox review, as you mentioned. There's some great elements, you know, and, and we'll comment on it. There, there's fun characters, there's fun sequences, and the cast is incredible. You have like 
star to star to star, and they all do fairly great jobs, uh, maybe except for John Boyd. Uh, but <laughs> you, and at the beginning of the film, you're like, wow, this could really be something. And it qu- very quickly falls apart because there is no connective tissue in any of this narrative. The, this narrative has nothing piecing each part together. It goes from story beat to story beat. Oh, it just kind of is like, uh, and then, and then, and then, and it just, this happens, and then this happens, and this happens, and nothing kind of pieces the two together, and only you, they will introduce a plot point, a significant plot point, a subplot, that will then be forgotten about two scenes after that, or even a scene after that. And not on top of that is, or on top of that is, the fact that this film is trying to go for something so thematically rich and yet it is completely hollow within its execution to the point where I'm not even certain to what Coppola was trying to say here. Mm -hmm. There's little tidbits of, of what I could get, but for such a narrative that is so inherently political, it seems like there's no decision or or standpoint that he's even made here within this film and yeah i'm getting uh, a little worked up but it's uh it's a shame i think i think it's a shame and um you know we're gonna talk about this probably for a a while but uh just kind of wrapping up my thoughts even the technical elements of this film that conceptually are really cool there's a lot of cool ideas but within its execution and its presentation it falls apart there's so there's a scene that starts off and introduces itself interestingly uh and we'll talk about it in spoilers but the editing is so unbearable i had no clue what was going on there's no geography in the scene and that persists within a bunch of things. You have really bad CGI. You have just really bad editing. You have, it's, it's a mess. It is a mess. And although, like I said, I respect it for being this unfiltered, just uh canvas of, of ideas. I don't think it justifies the overall package because as an overall package, I came out of here uh, with a headache. Yeah, so. I think that's. I think you did a great job of, of explaining all of it. One of the last parts that you described is exactly how I felt. I thought that conceptually, there were a lot of ideas that felt unique and new and original, mm. which is, like you said, it's very bold for someone at the age of Coppola, who's 85 at the time of the release of this film was able to conceptualize things like that. Um, The execution, on the other hand, is so piss poor that it really hurts the ideas, in a sense, because it feels like... People have been talking about how this movie is is overstuffed, and I think it's true, because it's an exhausting watch. It's not something in which, like... Even if he's trying to tell too many stories at once, like even when you talk about things that are like, I mean, this is an ensemble film. It is, Mm -hmm. Um, even though so much of the story revolves around Adam Driver's character. But there's too much of him. Like you were talking about the viewpoint, like if he's trying to have a political statement, there's no standpoint to have. I think he is trying to tell. He is trying to be surface level at every single category of anything all in one film and i had argued i said to you before we started recording too it feels like coppola set out to make a movie that had every single genre ever yeah and it's a it's bold to do something like that but it obviously is going to lead to a mess regardless of how great the artist is and coppola is one of cinema's greatest auteurs like he's known as that and i um he completely funded apocalypse now when that project came out, which is highly regarded by a lot of people as, as one of his greatest films, maybe besides the first two Godfathers. And when you understand what he had to go through to have this project be made in the first place, Hmm. it makes sense to me how it turned out, how it turned out. The thing that I walked away with seeing this movie was more so 
I wonder what this would have looked like if he would have been able to make it at a different point in time. I felt hmm. more interested in the concept of that versus what the final product of Megalopolis was. And I don't know if you felt similarly, but I feel like a lot of people were walking out of this movie feeling that way. Um, I'm on the IMDb page right now, actually, and it's just so crazy. And the trivia, people make it up. Who knows? But there's some interesting tidbits in here that are just so remarkable to me that I feel like it's worthy of bringing it up. Like, Lawrence Fishburne said that Coppola was talking about this movie when they were filming Apocalypse Now. Hmm. That's 44 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Conceptually, this has been in his mind to tell this story like this. And he was friends with George Lucas, hmm. who obviously has a very heavy sort of stranglehold on, on sci-fi as a genre in general and, and space operas, which this kind of acts as it's like, a, it's like a futuristic epic while also trying, like you said, to tell that like he it's a modernized New York, but it's also resembles a lot of the old Roman empire. And there's a lot of noir elements to it, but are they mm. effective? Probably not. You know, mm. like there's so much with this. And then there's another one where it talks about how they started pre-production in 2001 uh, and they held a table read with Paul Newman, Uma Thurman, Robert De Niro, James Gandolfini, Nicolas Cage, Leo, Russell Crowe, Edie Falco, and Kevin Spacey. Mm. And it's like, can you imagine like what that movie would have been and all the people that were cast in this movie and then eventually um, left like Zendaya and Kate Blanchett was attached to this movie and James Conn was attached to this movie. Um, Christian Bale was attached to this movie. And it's just remarkable to see that this, did, this movie came to light because yeah. there's so much, which we'll get into the spoiler when we get, when we get into spoilers, there's just so much with this movie that makes no sense whatsoever. Um, and it's jarring. The editing is definitely something where it just feels like um, it feels like you're waiting for something to happen in a scene. And then the scene just completely drops out. Hmm. Or like there's like something that's supposed to seem playful between characters and their relationship and their chemistry, but it's not there. I actually disagree with you on one point. I didn't think, and it's, I don't think it's a fault of the actors, but I didn't think a lot of the performances were very good in this movie. Hmm. And I don't think that, I think that's because the script was so convoluted hmm. and the initial cut of this movie we had heard was three and a half hours. Yeah. And the theatrical yeah. cut was two hours and 18 minutes. That's a lot of narrative that's cut out of this. I'm not saying that a director's cut, could have been that much better but mm. i'm curious to see what that full version of of the film would have been yeah i i agree with you i throughout the entire runtime i was sitting there and i was just thinking the same thing you were thinking of like what would this film have been like if it was released 20 years ago or 20 years in the future and also to the last point you made it's it's been a thing for so long and over time it has a hundred percent has changed so much. And even within its dis distribution uh, now being distributed by Lionsgate, it has been cut down significantly. So I uh, like it. You feel it. I feel it. Like there's entire just chunks of the narrative that just feel like they're just wiped gone. Like, like, there's even a point where, uh, where, uh, well, actually, wait, no, I'll save that for the spoiler. Okay. Sorry, I yeah, apologize. Yeah, no, but no, you're good. It just, it cuts to black and then, like, the next scene starts and you're like, what? Like, what happened? Anyhow. The narrative structure of this movie is not of, like, any film I've ever seen. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not that he's trying to be too, like, avant-garde. It's not like he's giving tributes or, oh, I mean, maybe he is giving tributes and odes to all these different points in time in cinema history. And like I said before, it's like, I just feel like he's trying to encapsulate everything in one film. Hmm. Every thought he's ever had in his mind yeah. written down yeah. with no structure and just saying, let's try to make this a movie. Yeah. So actually I would like to comment on that because uh, Giancarlo Esposito and, and I believe Francis Ford Coppola, the, individual interviews but and i'm kind of i'm paraphrasing so uh correct me if i'm wrong in the comments because but it is on the internet you can look it up it's either one of them or maybe both of them commented on essentially that where they were saying how the film is simply a 
collection of thoughts and 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 that that's what the film is and that the audience should go into the film looking at, at it as that and that is a philosophy that i respect and i've seen other films that have done that excellently you know non-continuity-esque films that kind of bring together just scene 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 and it does great but this film doesn't know where to stand and it's like one foot in the door and one foot out of the door of do we want to go full-on non-continuity-esque film where it is a bunch of random thoughts or do we want to have a structured narrative half of the film feels like it wants to be half the film does feels like it doesn't want to be so that philosophy does not justify the shit that was produced you know what i mean it's trying to make a 120 million dollar experimental epic Hmm. and there's no market for that and like you said it's it's really interesting that you brought up too like 20 years in the past even versus 20 years in the future like who knows if there is more of an audience for that 20 years in the future you know who knows if there is more um of an enamoring for content like this Hmm. 20 years ago you know um but i mean it's so hard to talk about this movie without going into spoilers with the story so at this point i mean we've been discussing it for a few minutes um but i feel like hopefully you guys can get an, an inkling of how we feel about this movie i do recommend you go and see this movie because i think that it's it's worthwhile even to have a discussion with other people about it it's a great water cooler type of movie. Mm. Ironically, though, it's funny because it's so hard to describe and discuss this movie with people who haven't seen it. Mm. Like I was trying to do that with uh, a friend of ours um, and he was like, I've read like seven reviews of this movie and I don't know if anybody has been able to wrap their brain around it. And I'm mm. like, that's how you feel when you walk out of the movie. You, you described it as a headache. I felt it just more as as like... I don't even know how to feel about this movie. I know that structurally as someone who's been a filmmaker and who has studied cinema and has a respect for Coppola at the same time, there's so many ideas there that feel like they're worthy of a larger discussion, but at the same time, and this is no fault of his own. It's like, is it worth this discussion when this guy is 85 years old? You know what I mean? And I think that that sort of is the best way we can encompass it without discussing technically spoilers. So um, if you guys haven't seen the film yet, be sure to go check out the film and then come back for the spoiler talk. Um, but we're going to talk spoilers now at this point. Um, and we'll, we'll start with Vinny because I know you've been you, there's certain things you've been wanting to discuss. Yeah, I, 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 I'm actually I'm excited because okay, now you get into the, the nitty gritty, the nitty gritty. Yeah. Um, right, where to start? OK, I get, first thing, because it's been on the top of my head for a while. A great example of concepts that feel like they should work but the execution is so poorly done wow platinum (laughs) greatest character name in existence (laughs) audrey plaza's character plays this uh financial news reporter that's trying to use this uh roman royal family to her advantage and there's a scene where she seduces shia labeouf who she's currently married to uh john voight being his father at the time and uh, Audrey Plaza seduces him and lays out some ground rules. And that scene, conceptually, and what he was, tr- I could see what he was trying to do, would have been something I loved. You're talking it's about the super- scene, the scene with, I'm sorry to cut you off. No, you're good. The scene with Wow and Claudio is what you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Towards the end of the film. Yeah, uh, Shia's character. Yes, okay, yeah. yes. Claudio, so. Yeah, yeah. He or she, um, or the film as a whole, this film, this scene almost feels like it's trying to go for something very uh, De Palma esque, right? Yeah, and or even uh, I almost feel a little sense of like Burton in a way. It's like the sound design of how she's like, well, first thing, and then second thing, third thing, right? And the camera's getting really inventive, the coloring and the lighting's getting really inventive. That is something that would have been so cool in my book. You know, I've, like I said, De Palma does that type of filmmaking really well. 
but the scene just is not clicking. It's like rubbing sandpaper against my skin. It's like such friction. It's not smooth at all because you have terrible sound design because while these uh, sound effects, these really bold sound effects are happening, you have this really annoying alarm going off and the ambient sound is completely overpowering it and the editing is just so giving you a headache and it's just and everything that came before that this narrative up to the point up to this point or and even after this point is so disjointed that i'm having uh, i'm i'm trying to work my head around why i should care about this scene or why it's important or what the significance of this is uh, anything uh, and it just doesn't work it is a stylized scene that like i said i'm gonna sound like a broken record by the end of this review but <laughs> it, it it's so, something that i've seen in other films and it works great but and it, it just does not work here it's like ah it's, i don't know yeah, it's like, it feel, it, so i was gonna say you brought up burton it reminded me of like frank miller like it, hmm. it gave me like sin city vibes in it yeah you know what i mean yeah. like it felt like it was pop art like in a weird way um, a big part of the reason, like you talked about the sound design as well as all the things you mentioned, plus uh, Shia's character talking over her talking, hmm. which again, and I just looked it up because I was curious. The film had three editors. So take that as you will. Hmm. Um, I don't know if they were all working in unison. Obviously, there are films that have multiple editors on them, but hmm. it feels like a movie that was probably so complicated to edit that I wonder how that all went. Having yeah. three editors in one at the same time is probably complicated. Um the thing for that scene that didn't work for me, going back to the point that I had made when we were talking in non-spoilers, is that I think that the chemistry between most of the cast, I don't buy. Mm. And I don't know if it's because there was a certain feeling on set or it was the I don't I don't know what it was, but it was almost like even all Aub like um Aubrey's portrayal of what I loved her character in Wild Platinum. Like you said, it was a character that should work on paper and she's perfectly cast for that role. Yeah. Um, you get this moment towards the beginning of the film because she's having an affair on um, Hamilton Crassus, who is played by John Voight with uh, Caesar, who is the main character of the film, Adam Driver. And you get a little bit of chemistry there, but then the scene with Shia's character, you get nothing for me really. Obviously, she didn't have any chemistry with John Voight. How could you? The age gap is insane. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's just it's very hard. It's very hard to even be believable. On top of that, the thing that struck me the most, unfortunately, because I like her, but I just don't know if Natalie Emanuel has the chops to lead a movie. Yeah, and yeah. I thought that casting her as Julia Cicero, who is the female lead of this film as the love interest of Adam Driver's uh, Caesar Catalina was a major mistake for the film. Mm. Because if you could have had something to take away from it, you could have... There's there's a there's an interesting built-in relationship and there's a really dramatic scene where, which we can get into the nuance of it later, obviously, but like you talked about in the beginning of the review, the big thing with Caesar is that he's the head of the, this um, architectural... Uh, futuristic movement and group called the design authority and he loses the ability to stop time which is a big part of his genius right and he loses it and you find out that julia is able to bring that back out of him or maybe julia is the one that possesses it herself and then gives it back to him and they start to have this really great sort of through line and future together because of it in a moment that's supposed to feel heavy because you could feel it thematically that it's supposed to feel heavy it feels weightless hmm. and it's a shame because I, again, I like Nat Natalie Emanuel. I loved her in game of Thrones. Um, but I thought the writing in game of Thrones was better. And I think that might have something to do with how we end up here in this moment. Even talking about the scene you just discussed with wow. And Claudio's characters, like there's no relationship that I believed. Interestingly enough, the only relationship I actually weirdly felt like a deeper thing for was the relationship between Driver's character and Lawrence Fishburne's character. Mm. As if they had known each other and had this unspoken bond yeah, for yeah. years. Mm. And I think that that kind of goes to the gravitas of those actors. Not to say that any of the other performers in this film aren't good performers, but there was something to that where I was just like, there's something more there. 
and I wanted to see more of Lawrence Fishburne's character, which unfortunately we don't get a lot of, but even Voight and LaBeouf, like their interactions didn't seem great. And you're talking about two real, like, I mean, John Voight's not necessarily a character actor, but he's a strong performer. Shia is a very unique performer mm. and we haven't seen Shia in a long time. If, if you guys aren't aware of all the controversy of Shia LaBeouf, look it up yourself. We're not here to gossip or talk about the shit that happened or yeah. didn't happen. But as a performer, there's nobody that does the things that he does or takes the risks that he does. And there are certain scenes that it, it works for him um, just being this manic, crazed, power-hungry POS, like, rich kid. Hmm. But the scene with WoW is a great example of something where there's supposed to be a bigger payoff for that scene, especially because we're getting close to a resolution, hmm. and it does nothing. Yeah. It just doesn't feel yeah. like anything. It feels like there's basically no true sensibility in what Coppola is trying to do with his storytelling. Yeah, I... Um... Oh my God! What's her name again? The uh, Miss Andrey from Game of uh, Her oh, her name in the film? Natalia Emanuel. Natalie so. Emanuel is the actress's name. The mm. character is Julia Cicero. Yeah. In the film. Uh, uh, Natalie, uh, I agree. She felt confused throughout this entire film. Like she was like kind of wandering, and I don't think that was the intention. Um, it almost felt like she kind of. It's going to sound really mean to say, and this is not an insult to her as an actor per se, but I, I think like you said, it's, it's a fault of Coppola's direction and script and her just not knowing what to do. But it seems like she kind of just wandered onto set sometimes mm -hmm. and then was told to dance um, without any further direction other than just, oh, oh you got it. Um, so, yeah, it's weird. I also want to kind of moving on. Let's talk about the boner scene. Um, <laughs> what a perfect segue, Vinny. Let's talk about the boner scene. Yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, so John Voight you know, finds out that uh, Shia and Audrey Plaza's characters are 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 are, are using him, <laughs> and he got a he's got a crossbow. He's got a big old boner, and he boom, he shoots them both and kills Audrey Plaza's while platinum. So that scene to me, right? Because it's with a bow and arrow. Yeah, it, yeah. With a, the, with a bow and arrow, he shoots her through the chest. Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah, and 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 not not to to add on to that, the, when he <laughs> unveils it underneath his blanket, it has a digital like sparkle, like ding, and both on the tip of the arrow before it goes into her chest. Um, but the uh, what I'm trying to say here is that. That scene is very comedic and, <laughs> and very satirical. And it had me and the entire theater dying laughing. But that also leads me to another problem with this film is that it tonally is all over the place. Because going back also to the thematic elements of this film and how thematically... It feels like it doesn't know what it wants to say, and it's so hollow, even though inherently it is a narrative that should be and is trying to be thematically rich. It doesn't know to be serious or to be satirical. I, By the time this film ended, there were so many scenes where I was like, okay, that was satirical, you know, kind of making fun of uh, political authority, but then also the film wants us to take it serious in ways and you have the duality of scenes like that and then when the scene when we find out that caesar adam driver's character is uh we find out she's not a minor but in the context of that moment that he's sleeping with a minor and it's very dramatic and serious so it's like the it's it feels like two completely different movies, mm -hmm. you know? I completely agree with you, and I, I think it's... It it goes back to what I was saying before. I, I feel like he really is trying to have an element of everything that's ever been in every movie ever. Hmm. It's so unbelievable to even think about it like that. But yeah. you even have... Like, you, the part you just brought up, a very dramatic scene, which we'll return to because it's a sequence... That scene in general I want to talk about, the whole sequence that happens in Madison Square Garden is insane that mm. uh, that whole big chunk of the movie that we get a lot of answers and, and things figured out and relationships finally built um but 
the part you're referring to in terms of the the scene with John Voight and the murder of Wow Platinum's character and, and shooting Claudio, um, it felt like I agree. Like my I saw this film with my brother and we were cracking up at it. But so much of the film is atmospheric and it's supposed to feel quiet and it's asking you to to sit and listen and this just feels totally like whiplash hmm. and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And it comes towards the end of the movie where you're supposed to have this big wrap up. And the end is also, it, it felt like the ending of this movie was not satisfying whatsoever. Yeah, like, I, I don't yeah. even know how to explain it, but it felt like they rushed to an end. Like the end felt like a Marvel movie. Yeah. It kind of just happens. Yeah. It's very weird the way that structurally they try to they try to loop certain things in. And I agree with you. The tone of this movie is so hard to put sort of your finger on it. This movie is described on IMDb under all the subgenres. You have epic, sci-fi, epic, tragedy, hmm. drama, fantasy, and sci-fi. I think all fair to say all of those things. Hmm. But it's definitely comedic hmm. at times. They play with sex. They play with drugs. They hmm. play with all these different things within the film or the context of the movie. Hmm. And it's just very unique in the way he's trying to tell the story. I want to talk about the, the Rome sequence hmm. essentially, because you get probably what th out of a two hour and 18 minute movie, you probably get 35 minutes in this Coliseum. You would think, right? Yeah. It was a very significant part. It's a significant part of the movie. And though I'm we're we're crapping on the movie and we will probably continue to do so throughout the review. When we talked about conceptually, I thought that it was so interesting to see Coppola go in this direction hmm. where externally you have this location that it says Madison Square Garden and it looks nothing like Madison Square Garden. And you go in and it has a mixture of modern art and the old entertainment value that came with the Roman times where you get in there and you have these big um, erected statues of Hamilton and wow for their marriage. Hmm. And you then have people horse racing in the middle of this Coliseum. Then you have wrestling as entertainment. Then you have break dancing and people hmm. doing backflips dressed as clowns. Yeah. And yeah. you have Grace Vanderwall's character <laughs> um, who is the one that's caught up in the scandal with Caesar um, Vesta Sweetwater, who multiplies and you can see through her and she's singing and it's this wonderful thing and it's technological it's futuristic it's it's esoteric it's an insane scene the mm. fact that that conceptually came from the brain of coppola is unbelievable because it has elements of like escape from new york and it has elements of uh like the, the ringland brothers circus and medieval times and yeah. it doesn't make yeah. any sense like, but, but you're so enamored by how interesting and weird it is. Um, and that was the thing that I actually really, I was getting interested in, in the, the geography of what he was trying to do and what he was trying to tell. Um, within that, you also get this drug sequence hmm. with Adam Driver's character hmm. that was so off kilter to me. And I'm curious on your thoughts of that too, and the editing and things like that, because that scene happening simultaneously while the blackmail is happening from from Claudio's character and this giant set piece, it felt like that's where the movie completely went off the rails for me. And I was like, where are we going? Like, where are we going next? And then then you start to build the relationship between Caesar and Julia after the scandal happens. And they kind of well, you talked about the the part about how he's initially blackmailed for sleeping with a minor, then you find out within a few minutes that she's not a minor and the plot point is dropped. Yep completely yeah. it's never brought up again vesta's never in the film again right if she might be in maybe towards the end one other time yeah i don't think she's ever in the film yeah again. and then you build the relationship between julie and caesar at this point hmm. like structurally it's just a mess like yeah. it's an absolute mess hmm. yeah i i i 100 percent agree i think uh it, it's it's just repeating everything we we've been saying is that this uh, the the entertainment scene within Madison Square Garden is probably my favorite conceptual scene in the entire film. And it starts off very interesting, but it just faulted completely, like mentioned before, 
by terrible editing and terrible structure, like you mentioned. He is put into prison, and we get one shot of him in prison, and then that's it. And then it's like a time skip, and we're like... A sort of significant mm. moment, too, in terms of his character, Mm. happens in that jail cell. Mm. And if you're not paying attention close enough, really, it just goes by. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm referring to, obviously, the scene with the fly. That's the only scene in the jail cell. Mm. He says, stop time, because he's trying to get the fly to just... And he can't stop time. And he can't stop time. And it just feels like it's a weightless moment. Hmm. which is supposed to be a major moment for his character in the film. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, I, I, I hundred percent agree. And like, this is, I, I love wacky, like out of control, big entertainment scenes. I, I mean, I just recently, maybe two months ago in the theater, I saw, uh, speaking of the Palma, I saw Phantom of the Paradise. And that is such a, just, epic exuberant very similar esque <clears throat> type of scene where a bunch of significant people are packed in this big theater and there's big performances going on and just chaos is going about that film does it exceptionally well this film does it shite because it is ter- it's just the editing i think i think it's a big fault of the editing is that like mentioned but like i mentioned before There's a certain flow and a certain friction, a rhythm that you have to establish within your film so that things work, especially for such a complicated scene where you're having, like you mentioned, so many different gears turning and so many different characters in one setting with different motives and different everything playing out at once. And as an editor, you have to be very skilled and nuanced. And like I said, conceptually, this was my favorite. Okay, maybe I could get along with this. Okay, oh, that felt like a really harsh turn. Okay, oh, oh, Adam Driver's doing this. Okay, uh, his arms, he has six arms now. He's tripping. Oh, hard cut. Now we're out of the acid trip. We're grounded again. Cut back to the acid trip in not a fluent way either. It just feels like almost like it, like, uh, Everything was working. It should be working as a well-oiled machine, but it was all working separately <clears throat> at different times. Yeah. And all these elements and all these little things that are not being executed correctly just boom, and the machine shuts down and crashes. And it feels aimless. I think the whole film feels aimless in the, in the end. Um But yeah, that was my. I think that's a great way to put it too, because the biggest thing for me, and I heard somebody else discussing this, so I don't want to take credit for this, but I thought of it after like hearing them say it. I was like, I totally agree. The biggest thing with this is like, despite those scenes where the narrative completely comes to a halt because of like the epic train wreck that it becomes in terms of editing and cinematography and and sound design and all these things, if there's a clear message that Coppola was trying to get out of this movie, you don't get it by the end of it. Yeah. yeah. And another film that was compared to this, that was critically panned, which I don't think was for the same budget might've been, but there was a clear, in my opinion, there was a clear vision for it. And I really enjoyed the movie and I was late to it. I saw it last year. Um, But Babylon, Hmm. which Damien Chazelle made Hmm. was a movie that I think it cost the same around like 120 million. It made 40 million or something like that. And people were like, this movie's bombastic. This movie is crazy. This movie's off the walls, but there's a clear intention of what he's trying to do. He's showing you an outlandish snapshot of the way that people in old Hollywood used to be Hmm. and the way that it used to be working on film sets and the way people used to go and party and do all these drugs and all these things. You get all of that in this 10 minute sequence within Megalopolis, but then there's, there's no repercussions for it. What does it mean for Caesar? Like with Margot Robbie's character in Babylon, you're constantly returning to her and what it means for her and the relationship with Diego Calva's character. And, and there's a through line Hmm. with this movie. You don't get that at all. And Caesar Catalina in general as a lead character is unique in the way that 
there's nothing to feel for him. Like you don't feel like you're on his side. You don't feel like you agree with what he's doing, but you also don't fault him for what he's doing. Mm. He's not an antagonist, but he's certainly not a protagonist. Mm. So how do you even handle that character? I am curious yeah. on your thoughts on Catalina in general with just leading this movie and Adam Driver's performance, which in, if I had to pick one performance that stood out to me, it was his because of the swings that he took. Um, again, I, I just like, I, I, I'm probably going to get shit on for saying this. I'm a fan of Shia LaBeouf for his acting. Hmm. I think he's a, he's an interesting actor and he does things like I said that a lot of people don't, don't do, but driver, um, no pun intended, drove the film at moments where I was like, Oh, okay. I can maybe see what he's trying to do here. And it's weird to say this, but there was an element of his version of this character that was the closest thing in my mind to exactly what Coppola wanted to get on screen. Hmm. Hmm. Like he's even comedic in some of his delivery. And I think it's more effective in his delivery than it is for any other person in their role in this whole movie. Yeah. I, I second that. I think though, the big fault and, and, and what is this is that the film cannot establish a reason why, why to care and why really anything. So, although I do agree with Adam Driver being the powerhouse, uh, m basically trying to hold this film up, uh, you know, on its feet, but you still have no reason to why should I care? Why should I care about his utopia? We we never really truly see. There's like one scene where we see kind of this class classism and this, you know, royal Roman privilege and then the lower economic people being pushed to these like broken down slums. And it's one scene and it's so it's so disjointed that you just there's it doesn't work so at the end of the day it's like why should i care uh, I, i'm not afraid to say it though i really enjoyed shia in this film i think shia like you said he he's he's, he's crazy <laughs> i mean but i think it works sometimes 100%. the scene when he just shows up in drag and he's just going absolutely bombastic with his, uh, in character his the his character's sisters, and they're they're just this weird g group of hooligans. And I I like how he portrays this character of having um you know he he he's a jester almost. Or this is a this is a film that is replicating old fables and these old archetypes he's a jester character mm. he has no side he's not he's not on this side or he's not on this side he's just trying to do what he wants and, yeah. and cause and wanting chaos. to be in the spotlight at the yeah. same time he wants the world to revolve around him and you see it in his interactions with his father with his cousin which that was another i'm, mm. I'm curious really quick before it like did you have any semblance that they were related until we we're 35 minutes into the movie? Cause I don't even think it's mentioned until we get to MSJ. Um, then, you're talking about Adam driver. Yeah. Caesar. No, well, there was a scene at the beginning. It was hard to tell, but fairly uh, maybe the second or third scene when it's the fashion runway and his sister who's friends with uh, Julia, uh, Natalie's character, um she's holding up a newspaper of caesar and the sister is like oh draw like uh devil horns and a evil mustache and then shia walks over and says uh are you talking about my cousin or, or some shit like that so that was that was the only That's reason. The, okay. Yeah. But yeah. other than that, if you miss that line of dialogue, you don't know their. Which I probably did, and I think in I think I initially had thought that his character and Chloe Feynman, who play siblings, hmm. I thought initially he was saying they were cousins, hmm. because it's also revealed in the movie that they have an ancestral relationship. Yeah. Which yeah. is just also just crazy, Coppola. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I do agree in terms of the shy stuff. I mean, like again, despite 
him being a problematic and brash human being at times. Mm. He is a remarkable performer. I mm. mean, Peanut Butter Falcon is one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, Honey Boy, I think, is fantastic. And mm. I think that f- he's great in Fury. I mean, there's um, there's probably another one or two that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Transformers. <laughs> oh, of course. Transform- How do you forget in Transformers? But he's, he's just a unique acting talent. And it's hard because, like, I – Seeing him out of this movie, I'm like, I want to see you do more stuff. Mm. I don't think he's going to get the chance to do that mm. because of his status in the industry. But maybe. I mean, we'll have to see what comes of it. But he is great in the movie. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like I said, it, it's if, – if you take individual elements, although – most of them don't work there are a few scenes where like the boner scene it's funny it does not work in the film at all and makes the film worse in my opinion but if you just single that and like clip it onto like tiktok oh it's it's funny and if you single that and clip the scene of shia walking into the bank and he's like he drops his hat and he goes pick up my hat and then they go pick up my hat pick up my hat that's funny as a package doesn't work yeah 100 percent. um is there anything else you wanted to cover in this the only thing we haven't mm. off the top of my head we haven't covered and i think it's kind of a, and it's not his fault again a great actor um esposito was is another one of the top build mm. characters in this is mayor cicero um oh let's talk about that scene let's talk about the first scene the first major scene in the film we're going backwards essentially with this movie which we basically are but the first scene major scene with all the characters being assembled in this scaffolding over this rendering of the city that mayor cicero john carlo esposito's character wants to do Hmm. and it felt like citizen kane to me yeah the way it was framed the way he was trying to tell a certain story um what was your takeaway with that scene because that was the first scene where i was like this is different like i was like this is weird but i kind of dig it but what the hell is he going for and shy is bouncing off the scaffolding and dustin hoffman shows up yeah we haven't seen in in like a decade so like what did you think like how did you feel coming out of that scene before everything sort of hit the like shit hit the fan yeah like i said at the beginning of our review going into this film like when it first started i i was feeling it i was i was messing with it and i did I think overall, I liked that scene because it, like you said, is conceptually very interesting and it kind of displays a really wild cast of characters in a really interesting way. But I think on a technical way, that was, I could already, it's one of the first major scenes, like you said, and I already am feeling that friction begin to begin to emerge and it only gets worse from there and like i said at the beginning review after that the film quickly falls apart i think uh (laughs) going into it i was okay the dial i you know i'm in the scene okay dialogue is is a little corny right now i I genuinely kind of don't know what they're saying they're very wordy and and very on the nose and then you're beginning to cut in weird ways that is completely ruining the geography of the scene. And I'm like, oh, whoa, where are we? Are we on that side of the room or are we on that side of the room? And it kind of gives you a headache. And, but I was like, okay, maybe I'll excuse it. I was feeling very optimistic about this film. Um, so I think overall, I didn't have too strong of an impression starting the film. But I was still optimistic. I still didn't think it was bad at that point. It's just only that those problems that you see kind of raising to the surface present in that scene begin to only amplify further down the runtime. And it just gets worse and worse. Yeah, I agree. I think there's more curiosity towards the beginning of the film. And then when you reach a certain point, you're like, oh, this is the way it's going to be the yeah. whole time yeah. and and then it kind of feels like you're like 
can they find a way out of this? Can they wrap it up in a concise way? Can they get me invested in a character? Can they invest get me invested in one of the six stories they're trying to tell? Hmm. And unfortunately, I think it falls. I think it falls flat. Um, was there anything else major you think we should cover? Or are you ready for scores? No, I I don't have anything else to yeah, cover. I, feel it's, like... I think I think maybe I was a little harsh on this film. I think uh, wrapping up my thoughts, it's just that there's still a lot that I respect about this. You know, I I mean, how can you not respect such a like unfiltered artistic vision? It's just that it unfortunately didn't work. You know, it didn't work for me at least. Maybe there's probably uh, some megalopolis mega fans already out there uh, who love this film, but. You know, it it was it was a good swing. It was a big swing, but ultimately, I think it was a strike. I agree. I think that um, despite there being some unique ideas and sensibilities of what Coppola was trying to go for, um, I think that the narrative structure of this movie is pretty awful. And mm. I think that if it was constructed in a different way, it might at least be a decent film. The interesting thing is, though, this is going to be one of the lowest scores I've given on the network. Hmm. It's a movie that if and when there is a director's cut, I have to see it. I agree. And I think it's because this is a movie that I'm glad I saw it. I'm glad I got the sensibility to see this vision that Coppola had for eons that he wanted to make this movie. And the other thing is like, I would love to see that. I think there was a documentary about the making of apocalypse now. That's mm. like revered. Mm. We need that for this movie. Yeah. Like if we are, if we are unfortunate that we don't get the telling of the making of this movie mm. that he was discussing 44 years ago with Lawrence Fishburne on the set of apocalypse. Now we would have been robbed. So, Mm. and I would love for it to be a doc. If it's a book, I'll read the book, whatever you got, Francis, please. Cause I need to know, I need to know what he was aiming for. I need to know what he's going for. It's a movie. I saw it yesterday as of our recording. Um, so it's still really fresh to me and I haven't had a chance to see Coppola talk about the film. I haven't had a chance to see any of the acting talent talk about the film, and I'm now really excited to kind of hear what they thought. And, and, I'm not going to say this in a mean way, but if you are a performer and Francis Ford Coppola comes to you about starring in a film, you're going to say yes. Hmm. Like he's a legend and it's like working with Scorsese for the first time. It's just something that a lot of actors cannot say no unless they have prior contractual agreements. And I think that's ultimately why a lot of performers were in this movie. Um, But I'm just so damn curious on, on what the initial vision of this movie was. Hmm. Um, are you ready for scores? I am. All right. Yeah. You want to start it off? Yeah, I, I started it off. I'm, I'm going to give Megalopolis a 4 out of 10. It might honestly be generous for, for what I, I was um, giving within this review, but 4 out of 10, I think w- with time, it's probably going to get lower, but I'll just leave it as a 4. So, I, so I'm... I gave Rebel Moon a four. Hmm. I said it was one of the worst movies I've seen. Hmm. Um, this is, it's close to that, but there's more in terms of the ideas that I respect out of this movie. So I'm going to give it a 4.5. Okay. Well, I'm going to barely yeah. give it, I'm going to, and that might also go down. It might go to a 4.3, 4.2, who knows if we're going to get real technical about it. Hmm. But a 4.5, I think is fair. I can never see this movie going higher than a five in my eyes. But again, I'm, I'm curious mm. to see if there's a director's cut and what that vision looks like. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. We need a megalopolis redux. We like do. Apocalypse now redux. A hundred percent. We absolutely do. But let us know in the comments, uh, if you guys checked out megalopolis and if you did, what were your thoughts on this movie? There's a ton we could discuss with you guys in the comment section. Vinny checks the comments. I check the comments. We'd love to continue mm. the discussion with you guys because this is a movie that I feel like deserves to be talked about. I don't know how many people have seen this movie. It unfortunately did not do well at the box office, especially compared to its $120 million um, sort of budget. But I'm curious to see what you guys might think. So be sure to write in the comments uh, your guys' thoughts on Megalopolis. Also, be sure to give this video a like if you guys can and subscribe to us. We are the Culture Wave Media Network. We're covering all things film and TV. We just covered Transformers 1. 
We have his three daughters on the channel now. We have The Substance, which Vinny and Zach just covered last week. Um, Vinny's going to be covering Uzumaki, an anime, with uh, Mark as well. Mm. And we got a lot of other stuff coming for you guys. Joker Folly Ado is coming out soon. We'll be covering that as well. There's a lot of stuff on our channel, so be sure to check that out. And you can follow us on all our social media platforms. All that stuff is going to be below me in the video and in the description as well. And uh, be sure to share this with all your friends and family. Just signing off, I am Darian Scalamoni. And I'm Vanilla Bano. And we'll see you guys next time. This is The Culture.